Okay, so we're recording now, and um, welcome to our Future Teacher Reactivated session on rich media. There are three rich media sessions, and this is the first one with primary focus on images, but obviously it overlaps a little bit. If you haven't attended the Future Teacher sessions and the reactive one, reactivated ones that we're running now, um, the whole idea is we're repeating the topics that we did in the previous uh, or in the first couple of years of the project, um, but more flipped, more focused on activities and more rooted in real, real experience of practitioners. And that's why most of the time now we're having um, three or more guest speakers um, for the sessions rather than myself and leading an analyst there um, delivering most of the content. Um, we usually collate what you said during registration that you most want to learn and Lillian does a bit of um, human analysis of that. What did you pick out Lillian? Um, yeah, so this time round, um, we obviously, uh, as we normally do, have a focus on accessibility. People are interested in how to ensure they can use images in an accessible and inclusive way. Mm -hmm. um, so they would like some guidance, some inspiration and advice just on teaching and learning with more imagery, especially now that we've pivoted to online methods. Um, and how we can kind of use images to promote interaction and engagement. Um, but uh, a really nice valid point someone wrote, uh, they use the word visual literacy, and that's very interesting. Um, visual literacy uh, in terms of staff, how do we ensure that our colleagues and, and ourselves are using the right kind of images uh, for what we're, what we're hoping to, to do, our learning outcomes. Um, but also for students, uh, ensuring that they understand what the images mean that we're using. And it led us to have a little discussion, which we'll bring up later, about icons and what they mean to different people. Um, but the fact that images mean different things to different people as well. So this idea of developing uh, uh, digital uh, and visual literacy. Um, so uh, Emma will touch a little bit on developing teacher skills, uh, like she does. Um, and some people are really keen on immersive technologies and visual techniques uh, that are coming up. So that's overall uh, what people want to get out of the session with us today. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen uh, very quickly. Screen two. Uh, we did set you a pre-session task, so we thought it would uh, be rather important for you for us to give you some feedback on that and to just to remind you that you've done that work for those of you that had and the kind of quality of content uh, that is available there. So on the Trisida, we asked people to uh, just put where they find different images. And in fact, this kind of emerged and evolved slightly to some people putting where they um, edit their images as well. So lots of good things here, just because something doesn't necessarily make it to the very top of the list in terms of the votes doesn't mean to say it's not worth looking at. So we would encourage you to scroll down to some of these that only had one or two votes because sometimes they didn't get a vote because somebody had added them, uh, but it was already on there somewhere up. There's a lot on here. It's easy to miss things, but there's some really nice points to look at. And some of those have come up several times, even if they weren't necessarily voted on several times. So do have a look at that. The other thing just to bear in mind, if I just swap my uh, browser over, is that not only have you got that pre-session task that you looked at, but that's all part of the, the massive learning object. You can see we're on, if you see the bottom right here, we're on slide 31 of 41 at the moment. All the slides before this were last sessions um, run through on images. That's got loads of really important information in it that's worth you looking at, including lots of further resources on using images effectively and inclusively. We'll come back to that word more. Um, f lots of free sources for imaging, images and image editing, expert tips and tools, uh, some, and the mind map, which you can copy and edit. And then finally, having looked at our resources, having listened to our presenters today, having kind of gone back to the slides before 31, and we give you the link uh, in the chat. There's the link already. Um, 
there's also some post session tasks we really would be encouraged if you don't just listen to people today don't just look at the resources but you also go and commit to these three things making your images more inclusive for more users making your use of images more creative and brilliant if you can then share that back with us so that's back now to Lillian I believe if I stop my sharing we're just going to go straight into uh, introducing our uh, next up we have Abby Jones from UC LAN uh, who is a practicing GP I'm not sure if we've had a practicing GP um, uh, with us here in Future Teacher before so we're very on it Abby uh, and uh, she's going to show us um, how she brings the practical elements uh, in, in teaching the students uh, especially now in the time of COVID. Thanks, Lillian. Um, um, I'm, I don't have any slides. Um, I, I'm going to show you something that we've used uh, to help us develop um, an interprofessional uh, session. Um, as Lillian said, uh, I am a GP, um, and but I also work um, at, for UCLan as the uh, interprofessional education lead at the School of Medicine. Um, and so what we did, I wanna, what I want to describe is the problem we had um, and what COVID did to us and how that made us go down a route of using uh, visual methods to try and help with our learning. So uh, our year four students, our year four medical students, they have um, a project um, and it's called the Frailty Project. Um, for those of the, that don't know about what frailty is, um, it is actually a medical condition um, and with an aging population, we do have a lot of elderly people that suffer with frailty. And it means that if they do have that, they have a number of conditions and problems that are a lot more difficult to manage. And the perfect example is that if you think of like maybe a little old lady who gets a urine infection, for her, that could be drastic. For somebody else who's very fit and well or younger, who doesn't have frailty, they'll be fine. And we've had this project where our students go out, find a patient that suffers from frailty, and they use something called a comprehensive geriatric assessment, a uh, CGA, um, to manage that patient. However, frailty itself is best managed um, in a multidisciplinary team with occupational therapists, pharmacists, physios, and so before um, we came, before COVID basically, we had come together um, at UCLan with seven other disciplines. Um, so we had um, occupation therapy, paramedics, physios, pharmacists, physician associates, and social works, work worker students. And we had 350 students. We thought, right, we're actually gonna get them together and we're gonna work on a project about frailty together um, to promote interdisciplinary working and interprofessional education. We thought, great, let's go. Um, we're going to get a patient, we're going to get a story, and we're, we're, going to, we're going to do this together. And then COVID happened, and it all felt like it was all going to be ruined. However, um, thankfully, I worked with an amazing team and um, across all the disciplines, and everyone was like, no, we can still do this, let's go. And we used Microsoft Teams as our, as our base. And we said, no, let's continue, let's make a patient story. So we had started a patient story and I thought, right, we want a lady. I'd actually met her, um, met someone like this, shall we say, um, when I, on my GP visits. And we made Florence Williamson. She was 88. She was of Afro-Caribbean origin. She'd been stuck inside because of COVID and she had a number of problems that needed sorting out. And this is where I came with my problem. We're now online and before we would probably have had maybe videos and some documentation for them to look at. How do I do this online? Um, and uh, Emma, who will be speaking later, she's, she's my brain, basically. Every, whenever I have a problem, I go to Emma and go, Emma, what do I do? I, need, I have this, what, what shall I do? And she's like, have you thought of ThingLink? And it was one of those kind of like light bulb moments where I was like, yes, this, this could work. This could really show what I want to get, what, our, what I want our students to see. Um, so, it, I mean, if, for those of you that don't know ThingLink, you can take any image and embed whatever content you want really. Um, so I thought, right, I'm gonna get an image of a lady um, uh, who, who's black with a paramedic and I'm gonna embed all this content. Could I find a picture? No, couldn't find a picture anywhere. And I, <laughs> I was looking at the, the thing before with all the different places to look. I looked everywhere and I asked my colleagues to look and we were right in the middle of um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was like, this is daft that I can't put the diversity in that I want 
Um, and I was like, what am I going to do? And, and actually, I hate to say it, part of me thought, maybe I'll just make a white. And I'm really glad that I just went, no, I'm not doing this. I'm going to make my own image. And thankfully, with Thinglink, you can put whatever image you want. And we had um, an Insta 360 camera, um, which sits on a, on a pole. And we have a room in um, uh, uh, at, at UCLan, a, a little pretend, um, what's the word, like a lounge. If I show you the picture, it'll make sense. And I took a picture myself. I create, we, we, I used uh, our clinical skills team and uh, Lillian, let me know if you can't see this, but I used our clinical yeah, skills team um, and I'll just put the, to build this image. And what it allowed me to do was that I could not only embed the content that I wanted them to see, but classically a picture says a thousand words and a lot of our health students will need to do home visits and they need to assess, they need to pick out information um, that's gonna make a difference to their patient. So if I go back and obviously we have a look at this image, obviously I have my hotspots, but there are other things to think about. She's on the sofa, you can see there's a duvet on her. What's going on there? Well, actually part of the story is that um, she's not, her mobility isn't great. She's not able to get up the stairs to her bedroom. So she's sleeping on the sofa. There's a biscuit in there that's empty. Well, actually she's just generally been eating biscuits and she's not looking after herself nutritionally. nutritionally. We've got a lot of medication lying down here. And if I press this, we can actually embed um, images to show the medication that she's been using. And our students could actually then have a look that she's actually using some of her husband's old medication. So I can add the complexity that I wanted um, that we see in health and seeing our patients. Um, and um, we, I was able to put things like looking at patient notes so I can actually have an electronic record. Um, if I'm not, I'm gonna just show you what that looks like. So when they click that, they open a SharePoint um, site, but this won't load up now. Um, and there I've, I've been able to create um, a GP record with, um, her notes, her investigations, her blood results, it never comes up when I want it to. Um, but you can have a look, there's a, there's a medication picture. But the main thing that we were looking at doing this, if you can see she's got um, a frame here that's not being used, there's lots of added information that's not specifically being pointed at, but they, as a group, they can have a look and see. The other thing that we added in was, um, and I'm gonna stop this in a second, is a telephone. Hi, am I through to Dr. Patel? Yes, this is, and actually that's a conversation between a paramedic and a GP. And that's actually the pinpoint of this story. Uh, so what happens in that, um, that uh, audio is the uh, paramedic is speaking to the GP, explaining that they've seen this patient and they're really worried and there's lots and lots of problems going on. And how we use this is that we were able to embed the content about the patient within it, and then the students would look at this on the actual event and work together in multidisciplinary teams or so about um, a team of 10 to 12 students um, from the seven different disciplines. And they would work together to create a management plan for this patient. How we then actually added a little bit more complexity. Well, if I just go back um, and close this. You can see this is my actual thing link screen and we actually had multiple thing links so we cloned them um, and this is the pharmacy's thing link and the reason why i did this was that one i was able to give um, the students a thing link beforehand so before the actual session for them to explore the image and get used to the technology before they're coming to something but also that they had their own hotspot. so you can see there's only one here with just some information about her medication. And how this was able to, we were able to use this is that in a real life situation with a patient, all of our multidisciplinary team members come to um, an event or come to a, come to a meeting with um, pieces of the story that only they have. It's almost like having a story, but only everyone has one chapter. Um, and what you kind of have to do in real life is put all those chapters together to come to the actual story so that you're able to um, sort it out and understand what's happening. So by giving each of the um, 
our disciplines, their own thing link with their own information that was discipline specific, I was able to give them that chapter of information. And their job was not only to come and work together, but to bring that information to the group and allow themselves to set themselves up, share the information that they have, share appropriately, and use that to put the puzzle together. Um, and by doing so, I think it really added the extra complexity that um, in healthcare that we see a lot with our patients. Um, and I think it made a huge difference. So I use Thing LinkedIn, obviously, the, in, a, in a multiple of ways by giving pre reading, by allowing to actually use on the day for new information that they had to integrate. Um, I'm actually going to just stop sharing now. Um, and what and what we then allowed them to do, we actually used a lot of other technology to allow them to continue their sort of visual learning experience. That is really loud. Sorry, I'm so sorry. And I think I was on mute for the halfway one. So <laughs> apologies for that. Have I got a minute to go? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant stuff. But... Um, so where was I? So, yeah, so when, so when they actually came together on the actual day within Microsoft Teams, we had um, three separate teams. Each of them had 10 mini teams and they all had then about 10 to 12 students in. Each team had their own individual Padlet. So we had a visual space for them to build their management plan. And then they were able to all, so I actually linked all of those Padlets into a master one. So students could then go and have a look and actually see the management plans that other groups were able to do. Um, we also used Wakelet um, as again, another visual way of having pre-reading and understanding. So, um, which was again built um, by our multidisciplinary team. So I had um, our pharmacy um, staff were kind enough to put together a resource about polypharmacy. Um, our OT and physio um, staff put together about mobility and falls. And that's why our students were able to get information across the board from the specialists that are best to give it, um, rather than just us all recreating things in a silo. Um, overall, the event was a really positive experience. Um, we had a bit of feedback um, with 70% of students say felt feeling that ThingLink was a great way of accessing patient information. Um, but for me, a picture allows you to give so much more detail, especially in a, in a complex environment. Um, and I really enjoyed using it. And now we're using it to actually create an escape room. So I've been really quite excited. I've been enjoying using um, a new method of learning. And I think the big thing about it is actually, we might use this when we're back face to face, because um, I think it's a great way of displaying um, information for our students. Thank you very thank much. You. Oh, thank you so much, Abby. And that passion and excitement that, that comes across is, is very evident. Um, and, and I'm sure that people are going to be kind of like typing in the chat and wanting to engage with, with your ideas. Very powerful, very, very powerful. Um, and Emma, who was working with you or, or instigated this, this whole idea, that's exactly the thing that Emma will, will talk about now. It's almost like uh, you never know what tool it is that excites a practitioner to go off and blossom into this um, amazing superhero uh, kind of lecturer like Abby <laughs> has just shown us. Um, that's absolutely amazing. So Emma, uh, over to you to, to tell us how you uh, impart a, a bit of your superhero skills to your uh, colleagues at UCLAN. Oh, fabulous. Thanks, Lily. And, and thanks for the opportunity to come talk to, to you guys. I'm definitely going to be um, interloping in lots of other webinars um, from the network, it looks really useful. So yeah, my name is Emma Glasby. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in digital learning in the Faculty of Health and Care at UCLan, um, and uh, uh, recently a National Teaching Fellow as well, which is, is just incredible um, and unexpected, I guess. And um, one of the things that I use a lot in face-to-face teaching and academic development tends to be um, imagery. And I'll show you my kind of trusty collection of photographs that I would take around with me everywhere. Um, or kind of malleable materials, I particularly like things like Play-Doh, um, to help people engage with concepts and um, particularly to develop reflection and metacognition skills. Um, 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen and show you a few things. Uh, so I am one of the um, kind of core team for um, a network called uh, Creative HE. Um, and hopefully you should be able to see that now. Yep. I'm just going to turn my video off so that I don't end up um, using my bandwidth on the video. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this is uh, the Creative HE Network, and this was the first event of this academic year when myself and a colleague, Sandra, um, at London Met, decided on um, responding to the community's needs. We were asked to look at how do we convert those traditional kind of face-to-face -face sessions into meaningful online engagement. Um, and, you know, if you are missing your Play-Doh or your photos or your glittery pens or your post-its, um, then we wanted to kind of fill that gap. Um, and on the event itself, which was last week, we had over 100 people attend, which is another point, actually, in terms of we have found that during... The, the COVID situation happening and post whatever we are post COVID mid pandemic still um, that actually we've seen a lot of people engaging with the, the network events and the online conversations um, and they've expressed that that's the first time they've been able to engage because it is online. So actually it's allowed people to access development that they couldn't access before. Um, and so, yeah, we, we were going to look and hope and share ideas across the network of how do we do this in an online environment. Um, and when you look at that kind of photo, um, the use of photos, uh, this is a really useful paper. I'll pop the link in the chat afterwards. Um, but for me, the photos that I use in, in reflective methods are around, really around um, allowing people to um, choose an image based on their instinct. And that allows them to connect with that kind of non-verbal, non-linear way of knowing and allow that to emerge through articulating what that um, image means for them in that particular environment. Um, and often it, it kind of relates to their kind of core values and beliefs, which when you're in academic development is really useful for helping staff to engage with what kinds of activities are going to be most congruent to who you are as a teacher. Um, and so what we did as part of that event um, was present using Padlet a series of um, open access Images. Most of these images are either ones that I've taken myself um, or they're from Pixabay. Um, and what we asked at the beginning, this was kind of the blank board, if you like. Um, and then we asked people to select an image that represented their, their vision for the academic year in some way. Um, we gave them the freedom to choose one of the images that was, thank you, um, we, to choose one of the images that was there already or add an image of their own. So it allowed for that pe that kind of, you're not starting with a blank piece of paper um, and the, there's a non-judgmental space there from, from, the, uh, from it not being blank to start with, uh, but also giving people the freedom to do with that, or do what they like with that board. Um, so they could either choose an image that was already there or add one of their own. And you can see a lot of people added ones of their own. Um, and we also asked them to add a comment to describe why they chose that image in particular. Why, how does that relate to the Creative HE community? And then we had a discussion, a little bit of a discussion um, around how we can help each other over the, over the coming year so that people can achieve their vision. Um, for this year and I just wanted to pull up um, from the chat of that um, of that session 
just a couple of sentences that people people um talked about so in particular they this is a this is related to the polar bear image which is down here um which is polar bear hanging on to some ice um and somebody said i am that polar bear recently started a new job in the middle of a pandemic and everything is happening together feel like i'm clinging on by my bear paws so busy and so exciting but also quite scary and possibly cold if i fall in somebody else came back to talking about that they chose the ripple in the water but for a similar reason and that's where that kind of the connection can start to happen um and then they started kind of challenging each other are you willing to jump in um to the water uh, and then it kind of um the conversation came out by, from a couple of other people um, looking more holistically at, at the academic environment um, and the risks associated with, with being an academic at this time. Um, and then somebody else came back at the end of that discussion talking about that kind of richness and diversity that was shared across, across those images. So that's just one example um, of using this kind of imagery that I would have traditionally used with physical photographs, but converted into a Padlet board. Um, and actually since then, um, somebody that came to the event has um, tweeted um, about using a similar approach uh, as a result of coming to the session um, to help nursing students reflect on ethics uh, using Im images as metaphors for complexities surrounding ethical decision making. Um, so I think that uh, in summary, let me stop sharing. Um, I think I, I particularly am drawn to using visual imagery because that's, that helps me be the best facilitator of learning that I can be. Uh, so people, other people get the best out of me. Um, but I also try and help others see through practical experience how they could apply similar approaches in their own teaching and hopefully they go off and, and do that. That's all I was going to say. I think I'm within my time. You've done brilliantly. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you. And again, another very inspiration. Oh, you've gone quiet, Lillian. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, very inspirational approach. Uh, thank you ever so much, Emma. And I think um, the, the, the key thing I wanted to say from that was that um, there's always two sides to, to any kind of conversation about images. There, there will always be a little bit of a fear factor from, from people who obviously are also grappling with uh, accessibility and inclusion um, and coming at it for the first time. But clearly, I can I can see that you know you, you you've uh, focused in on the enabling aspects of using imagery to deal with things that aren't easy to uh, evoke. You know, we talked about photo elicitation and 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 like you say, things like ethics they're not easy to deal with, and using images to try and uh, start that conversation is really powerful, really really powerful. Thank you. So um, we have some uh, comments in the chat, but uh, Ron, uh, I'm wondering if you'd like to um, showcase the 360 stuff before we go into discussions. Yeah, thanks, Lillian. And thanks, Steph, Abby and Emma. Fantastic stuff. Um, a reminder to everyone as well, I've just put a link in the text chat. No, I haven't, but I will now. Um, the presentation from... Uh, Stephanie is is embedded in the resource that we've provided access to um, and there's some notes and things about uh, Abby's presentation and uh, Emma's presentation and I'm sure they'll add further links in the text chat as well as we go through. Um, one of the things we thought is important to kind of just add though was you've seen a lot about use of 360 and I'm sure we've all got questions about um, some more questions about how that's being done. Um, and on the Future Teacher Project, we've been using 360 and I've been using 360 for quite a few years now. Um, and the tool that we're using, Xerti, certainly has lots of capability of um, using 360 with it, although it hasn't until 
um, now or until the next release had a, a kind of an easy offering side of it. You have to kind of add it by code or embed it from somewhere else rather than assembling and adding the hotspots direct in Xerti. But that's coming in our next release. And this is just a, a quick example of how that works. So this is one of our earlier future teacher meetings. And you can see we can uh, scroll around this and there's some hotspots and things. And there are definitely accessibility issues. So for instance, I can use the keyboard to to move around the, the the environment here, but I actually can't tab to the hotspots to to open them. Um, I can, of course, use the mouse and I get tooltips and I'll get a pop up. And this is an example of a, a Xerti resource opening and then another one of our future teacher resources. Um, and also, I kind of don't know how many people here are using 360 for you know social use, pleasure use, holiday use, and so on. Um, I certainly have, and uh, the access and the cost of 360 cameras is so cheap these days. Um, here's an example of a picture I took on holiday, and how much better is this than a static picture when you can kind of look around and see the, the entire environment and so on. And the way these work for people that are not familiar with them is just a single camera, take one picture and you get that 360 environment. And then, of course, you can use tools like ThingLink or, or Xerti to add the interactions and so on. Um, so very powerful and you know very easy and very accessible. There's a, a similar example here that I took. I'm I'm based in Newark, Nottinghamshire, and uh, you know this could be a guide. It's, I've, I've not had any, but it's just a guide to the Newark Castle area, and you can go through the scenes and so on. So very quick, very easy to create, and fantastic examples of student creation that we've already heard in the presentations. So what we wanted to do next was ask um, our guest speakers to all open their mics and um, you can all um, post um, questions and so on in the text chat. And it may well be that, you know, someone posts a question that would be easier to expand on by their own mic as well. And we can do that. So it'd be great to, to have some discussion going and to share some thoughts and examples of um, what we've already seen and perhaps what we haven't seen, because I'm conscious there are a few people in the in the list and the attendees that I know that are also doing great stuff with images and, and some of the scenarios and storytelling that we've heard about. I'll just pick a quick comment from uh, a cheeky chap, Julian Tenney, saying, is Zerti expensive? <laughs> well, I think maybe the the answer to that is obvious, given it's a free and open source tool. But we, we I'm not sure we've had any discussion about the cost of um, the other tools and so on that we've, we've seen. No, so there's a, a variety of things that we could open up the discussion now. So um, if people want to... Yeah. pop in there or open your mic if, if that's more appropriate um i'd like to kind of uh, reference some of the questions that have been asked of our speakers already um so uh, mike and nick are asking about thing link and keyboard accessibility i wonder if uh, steph and abby and emma could mention anything about that yeah, so I'm just going to jump in. You, you can tab again between the hotspots as well and then obviously there's the immersive reader for the content mm. Okay. Uh, so I also found that um, with the audio that we put, we were able to link to transcripts as well. Um, so the audio that we've got in ours um, links directly to a transcript to, for people who want to read it and it follows it along. Mm. Um, it also works really well on mobile devices as well. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. I guess the mobile experience will be perhaps one of those things that um, screen reader users might value. Um, Okay, so uh, we, we've got a question from Adam, a question for Emma. Do you come across any people who find it difficult to use images as metaphors? So um, sometimes at the beginning, um, in terms of uh, selecting an image, um, I guess the thing for me is to have that non-judgmental space um and you've always got somebody that's willing to share their um their story of why they've chosen that image and quite often i found actually 
that people will choose an image but not necessarily know why they've chosen that image so they won't have a specific metaphor in mind um but they'll be drawn to a particular image um and it's only when they start um talking through that image that that actually the clarity comes um of why they've connected with that and the metaphor kind of falls out of that if that makes sense so quite often the metaphor doesn't come first it's usually the the kind of um being drawn to yeah and i think um when ron Alistair and i were preparing for the session we we did mention as well about some people who maybe aren't at, as good at interpreting images you know they need specifics they need clear uh words um, and images are too woolly um but you know Alistair for instance we were we were talking about uh, yeah, I, icons yes, icon blindness <laughs> yeah and 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 Alistair's clearly uh, uh, ended up in the wrong male or female toilet. Uh, I I certainly have <laughs> sometimes when the icon's not. I don't know. You, you're slightly blind to it, you know. Or or I hesitate and I have to stand there and work out whether that's a male or a female. Uh, and Alistair gives a very clear, funny uh, illustration of uh, going to Scotland and uh, uh, on the male toilet, you've got a man in a kilt, which would throw you. <laughs> absolutely throw you um a, uh, go on there's a question from katie there about can you just use the panoramic feature on your phone and obviously we we're kind of having a lot of chat about 360 images but earlier on in our resource we have lots of examples of just adding interactions to normal images not necessarily 360 images and it's a technology that's changing all the time anyway so uh, you may well find that the 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 camera on your particular phone allows the generation of 360 images or panoramic images for sure. Um, and also there are kind of devices that will add on to, you can plug into your phone to make it a 360 camera. And, and as we talked about the, the cameras that can be used that are, are dedicated 360, uh, there's lots of them and, and can be very cheap. I think um, we've heard about the Insta, Insta 360s uh, range of cameras. I use a difficult to pronounce, but a Xiaomi Mi Sphere, which is quite which is quite cheap. But then obviously there are much higher ends and, and better quality. So it, there's kind of a level that you can start with and, and grow with and expand with according to need. Um, I'll put a link in the text chat to the earlier page where we uh, had a, a, a list of links to examples of different types of <clears throat> image interaction. Um, and so let's let's I mean, I, I think what we've what we've really heard about is the storytelling, the scenarios, the collaboration, the interaction and so on. It's not specifically about one tool or another. And I'll while the chat continues, I'll put some links to some other 360 tools in the text chat that people may be useful uh, and find useful and interested in. Um, yeah. I would be interested in a little bit more because I, <clears throat> I know there's a lot of people at the moment with the um, public sector website regulations and so on are, are twitchy about using images. And this is something that you've mentioned already, Lillian. I'm just um, wondering if Steph was talking about the immersive reader. Could you just tell us a little bit about how that works? Does it just go through each of the textual content of each of the hot spots you've put on there, Steph? Yeah, so um, if you're you're currently using Microsoft Teams, it's the same um, immersive reader experience. So um, it converts text to speech. You can also translate content. Um, you can customize the, the look as well. So you can change the background color, color overlay um, and reduce text overcrowding as well. So there's quite a few options to kind of customize that content. Yeah. And that's applicable for yeah the text only content that's been added um, as a hotspot within the thing link. OK, thank you. And I think one of the things we will inevitably find when we're looking at technologies like this, there may be they may be kind of three quarters of the way there in terms of accessibility to different users. But of course, for some users, actually, an alternative experience would just be a better one anyway. That doesn't mean to say you can't use that very positive experience for the other learners. But, um, you know, sometimes 
actually just giving you know some sort of in 3d spinning molecule picture or something if you're a blind person a ball and stick model might just be a better way of doing it and uh, and so we have to kind of recognize that sometimes an alternative is appropriate not just appropriate but it's a better way of adding value and sometimes actually just making the, the the core product you're dealing with as accessible as possible is also a really important approach so if there's something that doesn't quite work get back to the supplier and say you know i'd like you to improve this and that's the way things will move forward I was also going to add, following on from one of the questions in the chat, that um, I find that the 360 content that's been curated uh, separately, whether it's hard coded or someone's used something like Captivate Pro um, in Adobe or another system, um, it's harder to make that content accessible. So I have an example that I, I can share my screen so you can see, but with yeah. Finglink, again, um, I'll just show you in. Uh, oh, if you, someone could stop sharing now, I can just share that's, this example. So I've just got one of our mock-up examples here. So this is the immersive reader. Again, the good thing about ThingLink is you can change the architectural mode. So you can change the first shots if you've got a 360 video or image that appears for the user. Um, again, uh, students can also swipe around the room rather than using the, the gyro, which automatically pans around the room as well. And then this is um, all of the features that we have that I listed earlier on. So you okay. have yeah. the color overlays here and formatting text size as well, translation, um, and yeah, everything's all inbuilt into the system. And again, it matches the Microsoft Teams format. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. Thank you. Let's keep the conversation going, but um, to save a bit of time, I'll just navigate while I'm going to share my screen. Emma's got something to say while so, you're doing that. Oh, yeah, sorry, so it was just to come in around that alternatives suggestion um and something that works it, it depends on what you're trying to get your learners to do yeah, yeah. um and so uh, it might be that that if you um chose to do something like a, a self-reflective activity that you might choose to use a breadth of um images music clips quotes um the idea behind those is all to elicit that response yeah um that promotes the reflection uh and so you can you can choose to use those things rather than maybe providing a description of an image which might not necessarily evoke the emotional response yeah. that, that yeah. will cause the depth of reflection compared to a clip of a music or, or a quote something yeah. like that that's a really good point just got one more question, Emma, from a, a fan, mm -hmm. I think. Liza Penn Thomas is asking if you're going to run your session again. I, I, I believe your session runs in internal. Is that internal uh, for you, you clan? Oh, no. So the Creative HE Network is open to, to anyone. The next event, we run regular events. They're all, um, they're all open access. Uh, I posted the link to the blog. And the next event is a, um, a festive make-along live and Christmas party type event. Um, and I believe there's going to be, yeah, you need to bring toilet rolls to be able to make some stuff. Um, and uh, that's on the the 11th of December, uh, I think 12 till two. Um, I'm, I'm just um, editing the video recording of that session, of the particular session from last week. Um, and that'll be uploaded to the blog in the next week or so. So each session kind of has a slightly different focus, but the idea is that, that each session is, is very much about sharing from the network. Um, so it's useful to get involved and then um, see what happens as, an, as a result of that. Brilliant. Alistair or Ron? Um, let me just uh, cover the, the last, um, for people that haven't <clears throat> attended the Future Teacher webinars before, we have some, later pages where we talk about the journeys that we've created and there's a step-by-step -step guide and how you can access those journeys read mini courses that we've created around all of the topics that we cover in the webinars there's a page about um the three of us and if you want any direct um support with anything then our contact details are listed there 
Um, next steps. The next one is about Rich Media Audio, and we'll be keen to hear from anyone that might want to do a guest slot on, on that. And obviously, a lot of it overlaps anyway. We have an activity for you before you all leave, and, and that is the what one thing. And then we have a page that just summarizes the fact that we're using Xerti and what you're looking at is a Xerti resource. And you've seen some of the discussion in the text chat that um, <clears throat> we're, we're adding 360 imagery and so on to, to Xerti. But of course, there's much more to it and many more interaction types and so on uh, that you can build. Question. I don't understand. If you take a 360 image, how do you remove yourself from it? Um, uh, do you mean when you take in the photograph? Yeah, if you're if you're holding a 360 camera, then you'll be in the 360, won't you? Yeah, well, there's a there's a couple of solutions for that. Um, one is that typically what people do is use a remote to control the camera and then they hide behind a, a, a corner or whatever. You can if you if you're not standing in line with uh, other people in the shot you can obviously remove yourself uh, via post production via editing the image and so on um but also the the single shot type cameras that that do that kind of thing are certainly um useful and, and very quick and efficient but you can also use a dslr where what you do is take a number of single shots and pan around to create the, the 360 circumference and then shoot one up to the sky and down to the floor and then you use stitching software to stitch those together and one advantage that i hadn't appreciated that until i used that was that then you're not in the shot and you have much more control over mm -hmm. what is in the shot because you can take each shot um you know, separately and wait for a wait for traffic to go past, for instance. So um, quite easy to to kind of do that if you wanted to. I saw your question in the text chat and I thought, oh, dear, have I got someone in one of my shots that um, I haven't asked <laughs> permission for? But um, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, that okay. case. Um, I've just popped in there because we've we focused a little bit on the 360 degrees and the interactive images. Obviously, a lot of people are using images in very standard ways and might be interested if they're using a resource interested in knowing whether or not there's alternative text and appropriate alternative text on some of the other um, perhaps websites they're linking to or um, content on their existing pages. I've just popped a link into the Zoom chat um, of a little plugin that you can just if you get that plug into Chrome, you can hover the mouse over different images and it will tell you whether it has an alt text and what that alt text is. So it's quite handy for checking pages. So we usually finish off with um, getting you either via the text chat or via the text wall. And I, I put the link in the, the, the text chat. Um, what one thing you will um, take away and, and try to implement as a result of what you've seen and heard today. And perhaps, you know, a, a big thank you to all of our guest speakers and to everybody that contributed uh, including via you know questions via the text chat and so on um and be as specific as you can with the what one thing because that that helps us kind of identify what we might cover next time and what we've missed and so on and we usually have a an informal discussion at this point so <clears throat> i'm going to stop the re the recording